Mark Monson Mar 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 Delia was here know, almost 10 years ago now. Um, and I suppose by, by, I mean, by trade, I'm an osteopath. So by trade, I fix people's injuries. I get people out of a lot of pain, uh, whether that's a disc injury or a nerve, nerve root impingement, like whatever you like. Um, but my dominant profession is as a, as a business owner. So I own the, the Revitalized Health and Fitness Clinic, which is in Gravesend, uh, which is where we move people along a spectrum of health, from bad health to good health, whether that's mental health, physical health, physiological health, you name it, we move people along that spectrum with the best clinicians I can possibly get hold of. Um, now, my task today, in fact, to get you guys to cooperate with what I'm trying to do today, um, if any of you guys have got a pen and paper, I'd reckon, and you, and you feel like this is of something to interest to you, then I'd recommend that you get your pen and paper out now because I want your guys', you guys minds to be open, as open as possible. You're not gonna be judged, this isn't a test, but I want anything that you think of, anything that's a little bit of interest, I want you to write it down so you can ask me during the presentation. And as well as that, if you have any questions during the presentation, then please do not hesitate to put your hands up straight away. It'll be a lot more entertaining for me as well if I get a little bit of uh, feedback from you guys. So, I want you to focus throughout this whole presentation on the term adaptation. I want you to think about all of the things that you have found is difficult, whether that's physical, mental, physiological, emotional, and I want you just to keep thinking of the term adaptation, because this is gonna be coming uh, increasingly important, especially throughout this presentation. So, to start off with our story of adaptation, we need to re rewind the clocks all the way back. We need to rewind the clocks to 14, that's a million, I mean billion years ago. Uh, 14 billion years ago, uh, which is when the Big Bang occurred, which is wherever miraculously or randomly matter came into contact with energy and space, and then we have the universe. Now, it wasn't until one billion years after that that we even had light, and slowly throughout this process, we started to get the solidification or the changes of gases into liquids, uh, from stars to gas, or gases, which are stars, to liquids and solids, and then the matter which we call, say, Earth. And it wasn't until 10 billion years after that, after all this stardust has solidified into matter, that we then get oh, the first organism appearing on this planet. And this is where it starts to get really interesting for us, because now we've got a story of 4 billion years ago to today, where these organisms that carry information, whether that is early DNA or the more complex form of DNA which we have today to 200,000 years ago which were ever our first human being which means that every single one of you is the result of a 4 billion year fight of adaptation to your environment and then we have you guys where two people decided to combine their genetic information to create us. <coughs> Think of your DNA as an instruction manual on how to survive in the current world. But I want to ask you a question. Would you say that our DNA enables us to survive and thrive in our world? Put your hands up if you think, yes, it definitely enables us to thrive and survive in our world. Nice one. How come? You just think you've got a feeling. Yeah, keep your hands up. Someone give me a reason. Why does it help us to survive and thrive in our world? So, <laughs> any, any, is anyone, anyone vocal here? Any suggestions as to why it helps us to thrive and survive in our world? Yes. Evolution. Evolution, right. And what has that enabled us to do as human beings? Um, change over time. Yeah, but what does it enable us to do? Why are we so suited to our environment now? Um, it's like thumbs. Okay, so the dexterity yeah. of our fingers, which helps us to make tools, enter the information into a laptop or a computer, right? Yeah. Cool. Can anyone think of how our genetics let us down? in our modern day society. <laughs> no? All right, let me give you an example. I'll give you an example. Our liver and our pancreas, very, very good at taking sugar from our blood and storing it. Now, at the moment, we can put a lot of sugar into our bloodstream and our liver and our pancreas do a really good job at storing it. The problem is that we put so much sugar into our bloodstream and our liver and our pancreas start to pack up and then what does that lead to? 
diabetes. That's a, an example of how our genetics are starting to potentially not pay in our, fa our favour. The benefit is that we obviously have big brains and we have people in, pharmaceutical in the pharmaceutical industry who can come up with solutions to this. But my job as the owner of the, of the Revitalise Clinic is to make sure that all 3,500 of our patients and our clients are able to be moved along that spectrum from poor health to good health. And at the moment, we are, we're looking to expand to about 50 clinics over the next five years. Um, we're currently working on our second at the moment. What that means is that everything that I'm saying to you has to be very, very simple. Because if it's simple, then it gets across. So I want you guys to help me simplify my message of what is health as much as you can. So that's why I need you to be vocal. Because if you're vocal, you'll be helping me out. All right? So. I think that I have a pretty good idea of what health is, but seeing that we're in a school, I want you guys to tell me what you think intelligence is in the simplest way possible. What is intelligence? <coughs> if you come up with an answer, for example, to be good at maths, that's absolutely fine. Absolutely fine on any level. Please, someone, tell me what your definition of intelligence is. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, capacity solve problems. problems. Okay. Now, if you can do this and keep it to yourself and keep it in your own mind, does that make you intelligent? So, should there be a link between the external environment for you to become intelligent? Yeah or no? No? Okay, cool. So I'd say that my definition of intelligence is the capacity to take someone from something from the internal world and manifest it in the external world. It has to be able to do that, because otherwise, if the problem that you, ex that you express, solving problems, doesn't manifest itself in the external world, then it's useless. It's just a problem that you've solved in your own mind. It's almost virtual. You've just kept it to yourself. So I'd say that the definition of intelligence is being able to manifest what's in your internal world to the external world. Anyone disagree with that? No? Okay, cool. So then, what makes a genius? What's a genius? All right, cool. Let me ask you a question. Put your hands up if you think Einstein's a genius. Okay. You have to answer if I pick you. Why? <laughs> Why? What did he invent? What theories? And what does that do? How does that manifest itself in the external world? Does it? What type of engineering? Does it? Okay, cool, awesome. Is uh, Steve Jobs a genius? Put your hands up if you think he's a genius. Why? Mr. Paddock, why is Steve Jobs? Yeah, why is he a genius? We know we need now. Yeah. Awesome. And Muhammad Ali, is Muhammad Ali a genius? Yes? Put your hands up if you think Muhammad Ali is a genius. Yeah? Okay. I want you to uh, just wait with me one second. I want you to stand up if you think Muhammad Ali is a genius. Okay. Now check this out. So you've got one person, right? I'll stand for that. Two, three, nice. Four, five. Okay. Now check this out. Stand up, keep standing, keep standing. Now check this out, quiet down, quiet down, quiet down, quiet down. Now, keep standing if you like boxing. So, this is my point. Feel free to take a seat now. So, most people identified Muhammad Ali as a genius, also liked boxing. Mr. Pallet alluded to Steve Jobs being a genius because he knew what people wanted. And that, to me, is the definition of a genius. It's that manifestation from the internal to the external world, but it has to be demanded by a community or a population. If it's not, then it's useless. Right, next question. What is fitness? Think along the same lines. What is fitness? 
Any answers? Okay. I would define fitness as being able to take what you've manifested in your internal world and execute it through your physicality. So for example, Usain Bolt has to, the, first, the origin of him running 100 meters in under 10 seconds, he has to think of it first and then his body has to manifest itself in its environment, which will come after obviously countless years of training. Ronaldo, same thing, a sumo wrestler is fit for the task that he's set himself to. It's specific to what you want to physically manifest in your environment. So, next question. Alright, what is health? What is health? Yes. Nice. Where? Where? In relation to what? Okay, cool. So, if I was uh, in an environment, if I was healthy, and I had a, a mental state of well-being, a physical state of well-being, but as soon as you take me out of an incubator and you put me into the real world, all of that collapses. Am I healthy? Depends on the environment. Depends on the environment. Therefore, my definition of health would be how tolerant you are to the external world, how well you can protect your internal world from the external world. Now let me give you some examples of this. So the more tolerant you are to stress and trauma. Now the thing is that with this answer that you've so kindly given, there are two types of stress and there are two types of demand on our health that would expose the chinks in our armour when it comes to our health. You've got acute, which is short term, and you've got chronic, which is long term. Now let me give you an example of this. So that's me on the top left hand side. So that's me boxing for a uh, London versus Liverpool competition. Now, at the end of my career, I was one of the best boxers in London. I beat this guy uh, London versus, uh, in London versus Liverpool competition, but when I started, I was absolutely awful. I was scared, I was frightened. I would go to the toilet probably 20 times an hour before my first fight, and I would get into the ring, and I would just completely implode. I'd lose it. I'd, I'd probably win the first two minutes of the fight, then after that, I'd completely gas out. Now, the difference between whether or not I could thrive in that situation, or plummet in, situ in that situation, was whether that demand of my health or of my physical state was acute or chronic. For example, can someone give me a mental condition that arises when someone is exposed to large amounts of trauma for a long period of time? Yes. So post-traumatic stress syndrome, perfect. So I will guarantee you that if I was stuck in that ring every day, all day, for a prolonged period of time, my mental health would suffer. I'd suffer from aches and strains and injuries that I would not be able to recover because I do not have that refractory period between stress to recover from it. Let me give you another example. This is me in a, a strongman competition. That's me pulling a lorry which I think weighed five tons and that's a, a car which weighed about, uh, 100, about 200 kilos and we had to, I had to wreck that car as many times as I could in a minute and I had to pull the lorry as quick as I could. Now, Think of when I was boxing, it probably weighed about 75 kilos. So that car would have been almost three times my body weight. What do you think would have happened if I stood up and someone gave me that car and they told me to hold it when I was 75 kilos and I hadn't weight trained before? What would happen? My arms would probably be on the floor. There's no way I could have shifted that lorry. So therefore, if the demand, if the demand of your environment outweighs what you're tolerant of, then you will break. But if you, take off, if you take a certain base, a base that you're comfortable with, and you add bit by bit a certain amount of stress, bit more stress, bit more stress, bit more stress, at a rate that you can thrive with, then that's when you get an increased tolerance to your environment. And that's the difference between acute and chronic load. Now, When I first started 
to rebuild the clinic. So we went from a 300 to an 1800 square foot premises. It took six times as long as it should have done. I was literally hemorrhaging money trying to get this thing sorted. The council were threatening us to go, that they were going to shut us down for us to go out of business because we didn't meet certain procedures and they refused to meet with us. I had constant conflict with landlords and I was also trying to uh, manage my patient load at the same time. Every day I was waking up and knowing that I was going to have to do battle with the day. Is that acute or is that chronic load? Chronic load, because it's all day, every day. It got to the point where I started to feel a certain level of darkness around me. It would slow me down. Sometimes it would bring me to my knees. I just had to sit down. I would find myself walking at half the speed that I was used to. I'd find myself crying for no reason on the way to work. I'd find myself it being so difficult to get out of bed that I'd have to actually chuck myself out of bed to get out of bed in the morning. I started to eventually notice symptoms of what's called disassociation. I'd look at my hand and I wouldn't really think that it was mine anymore. I would see the walls and they'd be bending until eventually after all these symptoms started to accumulate, I collapsed at work. And then it was at that point that I decided that I had to see a counsellor. Everything in the background was good. I was sleeping more than I'd otherwise sleep. I was eating all the best foods that I could, that I could eat. I was exercising, I was doing all the things that should have, been, should have made me able to deal with this period of my life. But I couldn't, because although I had a healthy background, the load that I'd exposed myself to was so chronic and so intense that I could not adapt to it. And that is what, that is the problem when it comes to what a lot of you guys might be experiencing coming up to an exam period or something like that. If you cannot tolerate mentally what you're you're asking yourself to do, then unfortunately you're starting to go towards that point or that mental state where you start to get a little bit uneasy. And the key is to enter that phase of your life fully prepared with a state of mind and a state of physical well-being that you know can tolerate what you're about to put yourself through. If I hadn't had expanded so quickly, if I hadn't gone from a clinic that was six times the size, I might have adapted to it a lot better. I might have been at least tolerant of it. But unfortunately, for a small amount of time, it broke me. Fortunately, we're still able to finish the project, still able to finish the clinic, and now I can reassess my own mental state and come back a lot stronger. Now, there's one thing I wanted to talk to you about before I end this. The reason my previous, the previous definition of health tolerance to trauma is incorrect, is that it misses out the point that we are all human beings. We all have certain things that we can adapt to and certain things that we can't. Some of you guys could easily survive from four hours of sleep a night. Most of you will probably need at least seven and a half, maybe eight. There's certain things in your, in your guys' lives that you're not quite ready for yet. And if you preempt that, you can slowly condition yourselves mentally and physically and physiologically to be ready for that. But it's about having a rational mind and self-awareness to be able to pick challenges that you're pretty sure that you'll be able to get. And if you don't get them, and if you don't succeed in them, then you'll be able to handle the, down, the downfall after that. In, so the, the, if the response is appropriate to load and trauma, you will grow as individuals. If you slowly load your capacity for workload, slowly load your capacity of the demand of your intelligence and physicality, then you will throw. There's um, a philosophy that I've started to practice to help my mental well-being, and I found it very effective. And retrospectively, I realised that I was actually doing it even whilst I was boxing. Like I said to you guys, when I was boxing, I was so scared <coughs> to enter the ring. I was so scared to get in and fight a stranger for six or eight minutes. So what I used to actually do on the 40-minute bus ride home is I'd sit down, and I'd imagine my opponent's face on the uh, chair in front of me. Now, 
for a, lot of the, for a lot of you guys, if you imagine something that scares you, your heart rate races, your mind starts to quicken, you start doing things which are completely irrational. So what I actually started to do is just to slow, concentrate on slowing my heart rate whilst imagining my opponent's face. And it got to the point where I could actually fall asleep before my fights, and that's what enabled me to be one of the top uh, boxers in London. And there's uh, a few different uh, metaphors that come from Stoic philosophy, which has its origin about 2,000 years ago. Um, the first one, which I think you will find quite useful, is you fear in your mind more than what you fear in reality. So if you prepare yourself mentally for what could go wrong, and you accept that those are the odds, you, a lot of people's performance tends to increase, tends to improve. A lot of sportsmen do it. The other uh, metaphor is that of the archer. Uh, you guys are probably going to be going through, um, over the next four or five years, probably your, your most testing, testing period of your time intellectually that you could, that you could go through. And um, I want you to imagine your efforts uh, as an archer lining up to take a shot at a target. Now, the archer has, up until the arrow leaves his bow, to do everything he can to make sure that that arrow is going on target. He can train, he can sleep well, he can eat well, he can make sure he practices on the right target at the right time of day, etc, etc. But until the arrow leaves his bow, he has no control whatsoever. If the target moves, it's not his fault. If a gust of wind blows the arrow off track, it's not in his control, it's not his fault. So if, it does, if his uh, arrow does blow off, off track, what does he do? He gets up and he takes another shot. And I think that the reason why I want to share this with you guys is that you are going through a very intensive uh, process where you will constantly be uh, trying to achieve certain results to appeal to certain people, whether that's your teachers, your examiners, your, your uh, employers, etc. And I want you just to focus on the bowman, on the archer. You are only in control of everything up until the arrow leaves the bow. You're in control of everything until you sit at the exam. You're in control of everything until after the interview. You're not in control of how people perceive you, what they think of you, or the exam that you had on the day. So just do your best. Try and thrive in stressful situations. Be aware of what you can and you cannot tolerate. And I promise that you'll have a very healthy uh, life mentally and physically. Thank you.